Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's CITI program webinar. Today's topic is informed consent and research with wearable tech and is presented by Megan Doerr. This webinar will be recorded and the recording will be available on the CITI program's website. As a quick note, this webinar is for educational purposes only. It is not designed to provide legal advice or legal guidance. You should consult with your organization's attorneys if you have questions or concerns about the relevant laws and regulations discussed in this webinar. The views expressed in the webinar are solely those of the presenter. Now, let me tell you about today's presenter. Meg Dorr is a principal scientist at Sage BioNetworks, where she supports innovative, participant-centric approaches to open science. Her work has a strong focus on app-based research, concentrating on the LC aspects of informed consent and secondary data use, including for the All of Us research program. And now, let me pass the mic to you, Meg. Well, everyone, welcome. It's lovely um, to have you join us um, this afternoon or morning or evening, whatever time it is where you are. Um, a few um, disclosures before I get started. I am co-inventor of, um, of a tool that I developed while I was at the Cleveland Clinic, and I am entitled uh, to both royalties and return on equity for that um, development, which is awesome. I receive salary support from a number of NIH grants, which is also awesome, um, including through the All of Us Research Program. I do a lot of volunteer work, including for the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health and for the National Society of Genetic Counselors. I am um, a genetic counselor by training. And my presentation is informed by a whole bunch of different sources, but a lot of work that I've done with my colleagues at Sage Bio Networks, including our elements of informed consent, and other papers um, and presentations and collaborations um, with, with people um, within the Yelsey community. Uh, but the views that I am presenting are my own. So our learning objectives for today. Um, we have a, uh, a very clear mandate here. We're gonna define wearables um, and list some examples and the data that they collect. Um, we're gonna talk about risk and uh, a new way or a different model of considering risk when we think about uh, wearable enabled research. Then we're going to be discussing the sources of risk um, in wearable research um, for participants and then um, identify key concepts to support disclosure of those risks to participants. So wearables are electronic devices or technology with embedded sensors that travel on, in, or through a person. So you can see a whole smattering of them over there on the right side of the screen there. So it includes your phone and your smart ring and your smart watch. Um, there's also um, fitness gadgets that you use, probably you've used a pedometer, um, a smart pedometer in the past. Um, there are things like virtual reality glasses and then um, monitoring devices like glucose monitors. Um, or retina sensors. These wearable technologies may or may not be considered technically a medical device. You'll remember that a medical device is a term of art um, for the FDA um, defined by section um, 201H of the Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act. Um, medical devices are intended for the use in diagnosis, cure, mitigation, treatment, or prevention of disease or conditions. Wearables some of them are medical devices and others of them are just monitors, right? They're not considered um, devices by the FDA. You probably have at least one wearable device within arm's length of you right now. Um, many of you are probably um, sporting more than one wearable device even at this point. They're very, very common. So some examples of data that we can gather from wearable devices. We have some pretty typical stuff that we usually think of when we think about health research, like blood pressure and temperature, heart rhythm. There was a lot of excitement um, in 2008 when um, Apple got FDA approval for their ECG, um, which is a class two medical device. Um, uh, so you can find out heart rhythm, uh, blood sugar levels, sleep patterns. There's been a lot of exciting uh, work here. Also motion vectors. A motion vector is um, when you look at the relative displacement of a person in relationship to a point in space. Um, so it doesn't tell you exactly where they are, but it tells you where they've been or, or um, how much movement they've had. 
obviously that could be very helpful in health studies. So don't forget to address who else will have access to the data besides the research team, um, the selling or renting of data uh, to third parties, and reconciling the terms of service and privacy policy with the terms of the informed consent. All of these different wearable devices work together in concert with one another. Um, and so make out a, make a diagram, think about all of the different wearables or all of the different connection points that are gonna be happening in your study. So in summary, wearable device research is a new area for many people um, and certainly is an ever expanding and continuously and rapidly changing field. It's really important for us to stay humble. Um, we need to ask questions and talk to experts like engineers. Um, I can't tell you the number of times I've learned something new from talking with engineers of wearable devices um, and app um, app developers. They are a fountain of information. I had one person say, well, what if they don't respond to you? If you're thinking about using a commercial device in your research study and they don't respond, if engineers don't respond, that's a red, red flag. Like if they're not willing to tell you what type of data they're collecting, you probably don't want to be anywhere near that app or wearable device. I encourage you to think carefully about the sources of risk. We walked through a lot of different sources. Remember that people are very phenomenally bad at understanding privacy and you need to take time to explain it to people because it's the primary risk in wearable studies, I would argue. Um, be creative about how you disclose risk. Just-in-time permissions are a great example of that. And of course, always an informed consent and privacy policies in terms of service use plain language. There's no need for all caps, that's just yelling. Uh, we do have some time for some questions. We've, we have received some questions from the audience. So I'll start with the first one. How does informed consent, in this case, interact with privacy laws regarding public filming? So, <laughs> so it's, this is really, really tricky. Um, and this is an area of, of research right now. So um, in public places, um, we're in, pretty safe territory, um, there's, um, there's no expectation of privacy. But when it comes to um, wearable device research and there, and there could conceivably be an expectation of privacy, that's when we can run very quickly afoul of the law. Um, and so I would really, really strongly recommend that people give informed consent. I mean, one of the challenges with the with the Duke study that I mentioned was that although um, there had been postings uh, uh, of signs around the area that was being filmed, um, that not everybody saw them and then the, the context of the filming changed. Um, and so it wasn't a very effective notification system. So again, we wanna be trying to be as explicit as possible with people when we're gathering data about them to use in research, especially when we're doing it um, in places or in ways that could be potentially considered private or somewhat private. I invite you all to review our content offerings regularly. As at City Program, we are continually adding new courses that may be of interest to you. All of our content is available to you anytime through organizational and individual subscriptions. 